we are going to talk about artificial intelligence. And there's no great surprise there, because it seems that the whole world is currently talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, in fact, we are rather saturated with movies and books and news stories and famous people all giving us a view about this future of AI. And sentiment in this area is quite mixed. For example, uh, spoiler alert, in the film Ex Machina, an artificially intelligent robot goes bad and kills people. And in the film I, Robot, an artificially intelligent robot goes bad and kills people. <laughs> and in the new film Morgan, an artificially intelligent robot child goes bad and kills people. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, brilliant people such as Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking have been quite vocal recently in their views on a world in future in which artificial intelligence goes bad and kills everybody. <laughs> so, not entirely positive. I'm being slightly facetious, obviously. The films are good fun, and when the likes of Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking are speaking, then the likes of me need to be paying attention. But they are all talking about a future in which AI has become self-aware, uh, possessing its own motive and drive, even its own consciousness, and that's not where we are right now. But is it likely? Well, a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory recently stated that soon there will be no technological barrier preventing us from creating machines that have their own consciousness. And he might be right. Maybe technology is not the barrier here. Maybe the barrier here is actually our understanding of what consciousness even is, because we know so little about it. Professor Margaret Bowden, is the head of cognitive science at Sussex University, near where I live in England. She's an amazing character in the whole field of uh, cognition and intelligence, creativity, the mind. She said quite recently that we know so little about consciousness, that it's not that we can't answer the big questions. We don't even know what questions to ask. So maybe we're not quite yet ready to replicate this process artificially. A better question might be, does that even matter? I'm sure we're all aware of the Turing test, the Turing test where chatbots have conversations with humans and in so doing try to convince those humans that they're actually having conversations with other humans, uh, thereby showing some form of intelligence. And uh, recent times, depending on what you read, we've either come close to or have actually passed the Turing test. Um, but no one would think that these chatbots are actually intelligent. They just fool us into thinking they are. And that's rather the point. At the time when a machine behaves as though it's intelligent, and we behave towards it as though it's intelligent, does it really matter whether it's intelligent or not in terms of the impact that that can have on our lives? And AI is having a massive impact on the world right now, and some of that impact is profoundly beneficial to the whole world. For example, in the area of health, uh, IBM have been pushing Watson and Watson Health, and it's already saving lives by diagnosing rare forms of leukemia. Uh, in London, in England, uh, Moorfields Eye Hospital, which is an amazing place, um, have partnered with DeepMind from Google in order to analyze huge data sets from eye scans and find and prevent the illnesses that cause blindness. This is fantastic stuff. And the field of education, where we've been lumbered since day one with the idea that in order to educate people, we need to get large groups of people together in the same place, at the same time, and tell them the same thing in the same way. Or does it have to be this way? How easy is that to do in large areas where it's very difficult to get those people together? And they have very different capabilities. Um, a company called I Am Lango, this is their image. Uh, they are working in Africa with a system with a virtual tutor and, uh, and an adaptive learning system. They can reach these children one-to-one -one and offer them through the virtual tutor um, a personal tuition, one-to-one -one personal tuition, with a system which is adapting to the individual learning capabilities of the child, which is amazing. Potentially at scale, it offers us the opportunity to raise the education level of an entire region through AI, and we're only here scratching the surface of the benefits that AI can deliver. On the flip side of this are the fears and anxieties for a world of AI. And right now, those fears and anxieties tend to focus on the idea that artificial intelligence will automate us out of our places of work. This is actually not a new film. It's quite old. This is an Amazon warehouse 
being run by robots. In being an old film, that actually shows us this is not just a fear, this is reality. Only the scale of this situation is really a debating point. And there have been plenty of studies on this subject. Uh, recently, a Vox article quoted uh, Morgan Stanley as suggesting that in the States, the freight industry will be able to save over $160 billion a year through the use of autonomous technologies. And over half of that, over $80 billion of savings will come in the forms of staff reductions. An oft-quoted study uh, from 2013 by Carl Frey, Michael Osborne, suggested that in the States also, 47% of people with jobs in the States have jobs which are at risk of immediate potential automation. 47% represents a vast number of individual human beings. A far less intelligent man uh, stated the blindingly obvious recently when he pointed out that we face a time of major upheaval. So the companies that are creating these technologies, um, how are they facing up to the fears and anxieties surrounding the technologies that they're working on? Well, actually, it's quite a positive story. Um, so recently, IBM, Microsoft, Google, Facebook and Amazon created something of an alliance to tackle some of these issues. They called it the Partnership on Artificial Intelligence for the Benefit of People, which is a nice title, if not particularly catchy. Um, and they're looking to tackle these issues of ethics, of robustness, of trust, of security, that AI gives rise to. Uh, Elon Musk, who we mentioned earlier, founded OpenAI for the billion dollars um, in order to try and prevent this incredible technology from falling under the control of individual powerful people. They have a mantra to develop digital intelligence in the ways most likely to benefit humanity as a whole, which is a wonderful aspiration to have. And then IBM sponsoring the X Prize uh, to offer financial rewards to startups who can partner with AI to confront the world's grandest challenges. So, the tech giants have our best interests at heart. And this, I think we can all agree, is reassuring. But what does it mean for the rest of us? Are we all, the population as a whole, are we just sitting, watching, and waiting to see what world is created for us and that we will then try to work out how to live in? Or can we proactively prepare for this world, set the scene for a world that we have a role in, that we have a place in? Well, I think we can. And the reason that we can is because although this revolution is being brought to us through technology, the challenges we face in preparing for that are entirely human challenges with entirely human solutions. And there are three things that I think we need to focus on. The first is education. Uh, you'll be glad to know that I don't have any children, uh, but I suspect a number of you will, um, either now or in the future. Are those people learning what they need to learn in order to have an active role to play in the future which is being created for them? We clearly need uh, to create a curriculum, syllabus, that trains people in the skills and the attributes they need to work on or with these autonomous technologies. To be able to be complementary to them rather than in conflict with them. Knowing what we know about the professions which are at risk of immediate automation means we can prepare people to have successful and sustainable careers in areas which are far at less risk. Not doing so means we risk creating generations of people who, upon leaving our educational systems, are immediately lost. This involves our boards of education, our schools, our colleges, our government agencies, which are all bodies we have a voice in that we must use. Secondly, dialogue, a conversation. It would be nice to think that the companies who are creating the technologies which will revolutionize the world would take into account the thoughts and feelings of the people whose world it is that is being revolutionized. That might seem like something of a pipe dream. There is actually a recent precedent uh, in this area, albeit on a small scale, uh, with a technology which we know is already transforming the world, that of autonomous cars, self-driving vehicles. Every major uh, motor automotive company is currently engaged in a program of work on autonomous driving. Volvo is one of those. Volvo actually were keen to take on board the hopes, aspirations, and opinions, and anxieties of the people for whom they are creating the vehicles and use that to shape the program of work. 
they opened a channel to allow people to answer a string of situational questions, such as do autonomous cars result in the end of traffic accidents to publish the figures so that we can all be aware of what opinions are in this area, and then to take the data set that they create inward and allow it to shape the work that they're doing. Now, the stance that we've seen being taken by the major organizations suggests that this is not something they would shy away from. I think they would welcome this. The third challenge we face is by far the biggest uh, on a massive scale, and it is the problem of the distribution of resources. We have created a world over thousands of years where resources are distributed based on work that gets done. So you work, you therefore have access to the resources that you need. What happens when people stop working? Currently, we have welfare schemes, benefit schemes for those people because they are the exception. But what happens when the exception becomes the rule? Now, Stephen Hawking, a very clever man, obviously, who we mentioned earlier, he put this quite succinctly when he said recently, and I'm paraphrasing now, in a world where machines produce what we need, the outcome will depend on how things are distributed. We can all live lives of luxury if the machine-produced wealth is shared or the majority can live lives that are miserably poor if the machine owners successfully lobby against the redistribution of wealth, which is pretty clear. Sadly, he went on to say that the trend historically is toward the latter, which is about as disappointing as it is predictable. Uh, now, at this point, uh, a colleague of mine suggested that all of these talks should have a picture of the planet Earth in order to add gravitas. Here's mine. Uh, so, uh, box ticked, I think. Um, what we need to do is to fundamentally decouple the distribution of resources from the idea of work. And this seems like a gargantuan task, perhaps, perhaps insurmountable. But actually, there are people who have a proposition to tackle this head on. And we heard about this in an inspirational talk this morning, the idea of a universal basic income. Now, this idea of giving people money for basically for being there um, is not a new one. It's come back to the fore largely because of this threat of automation. Um, and I was one of those people, I, I'm ashamed to admit, that did jump to the rather cynical assumption that if you give people money for doing nothing, then they will do nothing. But actually, sometimes in life, it's rather nice uh, to be given the impression that you could well be wrong here. And this scheme that's being run in Kenya is being run by an organization called Give Directly. And they have invested and they've raised funding to give people, a sizable community of people in Kenya, a living wage over a period of about 10 years in order to see how they respond. And the way they talk about this response right now is entirely positive. It's interesting, given uh, the control that people have been given over their lives, to see how productively they work on behalf of themselves, their families, their communities, and Give Directly are expanding their activities uh, into Uganda. So good for Africa, would it work in other parts of the world? Well, we're about to find out with those programs, uh, pilot programs being rolled out in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, in Ontario, Canada, and in Finland. So this is an idea that has traction uh, that could spread. However, there are also countries who have already rejected this idea. So there is no global consensus and nothing is yet proven. And I'm not showing you this because I think this is the solution, because frankly, I don't know. I'm showing you this to demonstrate that there are people who believe this problem can be solved, and they believe in their solution, to work on it, to back it, to implement that solution, and test it out in the real world, and that is profoundly positive, because where there is one solution and a set of motivated people to carry it through, there can be others. So three things to prepare us for a future with an artificially intelligent revolution. Preparing our next generations so that they can enter this world with a full and vital role to play in it. Having a say, even a small one, even a tiny one, in the development of those technologies. And lastly, confronting the biggest challenge of all, how we distribute the resources on Earth. Three things, but three human things. Now we started, with the talk about artificial intelligence. And we've ended up somewhere much, much bigger. The future for everyone. Artificial intelligence has yet to reach a point where it is beyond our ability to influence its development. 
this technology revolution is coming, bringing with it, as we've seen, huge benefits and equally huge challenges. We can let those challenges overwhelm us if we choose not to confront them. Or we can work to slowly build a world in which the benefits of this revolution are made available to us all. Thank you very much. <laughs>